Can you hear me okay? We can. Okay, mm -hmm. great. Well, welcome to uh, all of you. This is fantastic. Um, you know, Michael, you know, you're, you're a hero with uh, people like us. Uh, well, well, my blushes. Um, my Virginia roots run very deep. I went to high school in Virginia Beach, and I have several degrees from the University of Virginia. So uh, um, it's good to meet you all. Um, I am the um, chair of the incoming chair of the core ebooks interest group. I hope you all follow that group. Um, a member of the joint digital content working group and and the project manager for Readers First, which is kind of how I, I got involved with this legislation with Maryland. Um, we, I, I sent some documents that I hope have been shared, um, uh, yeah. just a press release and, mm -hmm. and some talking points uh, that we use to kind of get going. Um, so let me just kind of ask what it is uh, you would like. <laughs> Well, part of our, this, this group is a committee of the Library Board of Trustees for Fairfax County. And it's a collaborative group with our Library Foundation as well as a, a Northern Virginia Regional Cooperative. So we invited a bunch of other folks from different systems to participate. And the committee's met twice now with uh, one potential goal being to push forward similar legislation to what Maryland and New York have done so far. So uh, my guess is that part of the committee's interest in having you participate, it was a request at last month's meeting, was just to kind of ask you questions and get a feel for how the process went in Maryland, um, sure. what kind of pushback you all got. Those were the big pieces I had thought of. Gary, what, what other topics would you like Mr. Blackwell to cover? Oh, and Gary me, is uh, the Michael. chair of this committee. Please call, please call me Michael. We, we don't have to be that formal. I, I think that sums it up in general, but I must confess, uh, I made a list here of questions. Good. Okay. Good. You'll all miss supper if I ask them all. Um, sure, uh, happy, to, happy to, to answer whatever questions you have as, as best I can. If I can't give you a, a good answer on something, I, I'll, uh, I'll get back with you on it. Um, first of all, just uh, two other developments. Um, one is that um, Rhode Island has legislation pending. Okay, yeah. And I would look at that. And the reason why I would look at that is that um, um, a gentleman from Harvard named Kyle Courtney, um, who you may have seen doing various um, ebook, uh, library ebook advocacy, including recently been with the Libraries Futures. Um, he's a copyright expert at Harvard University. He looked at the Maryland law and made some additions to it that I think are worth paying attention to. Um, there's just a bit more precision on what might happen if somebody does not, um, you know, or, or what is considered an unfair practice. And it makes sure to expand it as our bill did not because I was primarily working from a public library perspective to school and university libraries. So I would look at that, which I consider a more advanced draft and I can send you a link. Um, Diane, I can, can send you a link to that if you don't have it. Um, uh, a more advanced draft of this kind of legislation that would be worth pursuing if anybody's going to do so. The second update, and it's not public yet, um, I am working with Alan Inoue, who's the head of digital strategy at the American Library Association, uh, right there in Washington, DC, uh, very close to all of you. Um, Jonathan Band, who's a counsel with the ALA, and Carmi Parker, who some of you I know know personally, but who is the organizer of the Macmillan boycott on what exactly is reasonable. Yeah. And we have developed a document um, also with Sari Feldman, the former head of uh, the uh, former ALA president who's now working with Publishers Weekly. Um, so, uh, I've got comments back from Carmi, and, and she, th this, this draft has gone through a lot, as you can imagine, when you've got very intelligent, very strong-willed people together who may have slightly different aims. I, I think Jonathan wants to make it a, 
a launching pad for a lawsuit and Carmi wants to make it a launching pad to talk to publishers. So, um, but I think we've got a document that will, sol that will suit everybody. Um, where that's gonna go next is to Mirren Library Association, um, who I hope will release that the same way they release those press releases. And we're hoping that various groups will pick it up. I'm fairly certain that Publishers Le Weekly will cover it and LJ will cover it. And I've also been speaking with reporters from Washington Post, The Hill, AP, um, who are kind of interested in following these developments. So I'm hoping that that document kind of defining what reasonable is will get some attention. So um, basically um, how this worked was when Macmillan began its um, windowing, um, we in Maryland, um, like everybody else in the library community, was dismayed by that. Um, I was on our intergovernmental relations committee at that time. I've simply gone off that, but I'm still advising them on digital content matters. And sent a letter through Senator King, who's the majority leader of, the, of Maryland, to the Maryland Attorney General and asked several questions. Um, is windowing when you're providing things to consumers in Maryland legal? Is Amazon and Audible's withholding of content from libraries legal or constitutional? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is overdrives um, monopoly on the Kindle format which unbalances the library digital content market, a fair marketing or a fair um, practice. And the Attorney General emailed us back and, and said, well, you've got some interesting points here. Uh, what kind of lawsuit do you want to launch to have a real ruling on this? And of course, we said, uh, I don't think so. So mm -hmm. um, I was familiar um, with the Rhode Island legislation through a librarian there at Cranston. And we just said, okay, fine, let's try this. Um, so you'll need five things um, to make it work. And the first, um, it looks like you've got sitting all right there is, is a committee that can approach um, an entity, a, a lobbyist usually to help you get a bill moving forward. And I assume you, you probably have a lobbyist. Yeah, so, so part, of, part of the process here in Fairfax and we're uh, kind of taking the lead for Northern Virginia on this right now is we are a county agency. So it has to be on our county legislative platform. So the library board is taking the first step on this and then it'll be passed to our county for further review, discussion, hopeful implementation as part of our legislative platform. And through that process, likely identification of a patron who can take it forward. Okay, excellent. Um, the, the lobbyist kind of did that for us, um, although we, and I assume you have already as well with your county and probably at the state level as well, really got some strong supporters of libraries in the legislature. We um, have two former library board chair people. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. And those are gonna be perfect people to, um, introduce the legislation and to champion the legislation. And you definitely need that. Um, so one thing we're looking at in this document we're working on right now is what the legislators said when they introduced the bill, because that allows us to say, this is not what libraries want. This is what the legislation asks for. This is what the legislators are saying they are after. That's an important thing to know because when you get challenged, it's going to be the legislature putting this forward, having to, to be the ones who are sort of kind of the lead on what it says. So, um, you'll, you, so you've got at least three things there that you need. I'd say the next thing um, you've already got as well, and that's Diane. Um, it's somebody who's deeply connected with the library um, community especially folks who are kind of making digital content a passion. And, and Diane's a member of our Readers First Working Group and uh, has uh, written a paper with Carmi and me among other things. Um, so that person is essential for a couple of reasons. First of all, to the extent that your legislature, your lobbyists want you to get word out 
um, that person can say, all right, here's what's going on. It, you may find that your legislation and or lobbyist is going to say, we don't want any word coming out on this. We don't want them to know what's happening. We don't want opposition forming. Mm -hmm. My sense is that that's not going to be something that's going to work for you. Um, the American Association of Publishers yeah. will, will know. They will know. That's yeah. what they're paid to do. Um, so the other thing that person can do is when the opposition starts to form, and I, at, at this point, it's gone through Maryland and New York, so maybe the AAP or other watchdog groups are, are going to um, be less interested in a state-by-state -state lobby effort, but someone's probably going to come along and say, this is unconstitutional or this is against the law and here's why. And your library champion can reach out and say, all right, help me with this. In this case, Diane, I'd probably want you to talk to Alan and to Jonathan, whom we worked with. It's not costing you anything. Jonathan is not doing this as a fee to the library or to you. He's doing it for the ALA and he's really good. Um, he knows the law. When the AAP introduced testimony, very sneakily, the, you know, basically the morning or uh, uh, the day before the hearing in the Senate, they blasted their testimony to all the senators, giving us practically no time to even know it was there. But because um, we had Jonathan on tap, he in the afternoon was able to put together a rebuttal of their testimony that carried some weight. So those are kind of the, the elements that you're going to need to make this happen successfully. Um, your library champion is also going to need to come up with talking points that the legislatures will want to use. What are good, you know, what are good reasons why they should pass this bill? We really aimed it at, it's a benefit to library readers. This is not what libraries want. This is what people who read books want, especially people who might be disadvantaged economically or out of work because of COVID or otherwise not able to buy whatever ebook they want or listen to what a digital audio book they want by buying it. Did you all, so one of the, one of the drivers for us as a, as a library system has been that it, it is costing the taxpayers more money library to continually rebuy these materials because they're not at reasonable costs. And the fact that we can't get materials that they want means that they're at a disadvantage. Mm. Were you, did you all push that idea as well? The kind of taxpayer benefit to this? Yes, absolutely. And okay. I, I think that talking about, especially um, the, the fact that we have to constantly relicense this and that's points we gave them with specific examples. You know, um, two years ago, this ebook or this audio book might have cost us $50. Even that's four times what a consumer would pay, but you know, we're, hey, we're a library. Um, because we had perpetual access, now it's going to cost us $50 every two years. Ebooks are no mm -hmm. longer sustainable. Yeah. for libraries okay. that takes them away from readers and it's a it's a huge i mean you'll, you'll still have the, the same amount of money it's just that you get a lot less for your money because of these unfair practices and yes that's absolutely something to push is that this is a boost for what libraries can get with limited tax dollars uh, uh, jessica let me ask you a sort of a housekeeping question here um, our goal tonight is, is to uh, draft the language that we need uh, for uh, to get approval from the Board of Supervisors, which will in effect let us lobby, right? Well, I'm, I'm kind of thinking this is taking an interesting and slightly, not a different turn, but it might... Um, because we have Mr. Blackwell on the call today, Michael, sorry, uh, on the call today, it might make more sense to use your time today to uh, 
kind of pick his brain about things. And then I can send you all afterward a, a draft that incorporates some of the feedback that he's providing. And then you can spend your next meeting kind of picking apart the, the language for it, um, if that is agreeable. I was hoping you would say that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I think so. I mean, we're so fortunate to have Michael on this call and sharing his expertise. I, I think he is 100% right that there are going to be detractors on this, that the American Publishing Association and maybe even the Authors Guild are going to say that this is unconstitutional and that we're not playing fair and that we're violating copyright. And by using the knowledge that they already have to help us draft the legislative platform to go to the county, which will cover some of those talking points that he's mentioned. I think that's the best use of time for today, definitely. Um, Andrew Albany has published a piece in Publishers Weekly that presented the testimony from both sides. And I've shared that on Readers First among other things. But if you need a link to that, let me know. Mm -hmm. um, what I think AAP, and yes, Authors Guild may also come out against you, but they were not doing direct lobbying um, okay. in our case. They might in yours. Um, and I know that AAP tried in New York too, not surprisingly because, hey, that's right in the publisher's backyard. Um, what they're going to mm -hmm. say primarily is that this is a violation of copyright because Copyright works at a federal level and you're trying to impose at a state level on what are federal regulations. Ah. Um, I, I th Jonathan has picked apart this argument, first of all, by saying that the state has an overwhelming interest in providing content in an unfair business practice. Um, but the other thing that you can work with there is that they're cherry picking. They provide ebooks to libraries and audiobooks to libraries under license, not copyright. That's what I wanted. Yeah. So, them saying this is a violation of copyright, we can say, but we're not violating your copyright. We're not taking ownership. We don't have any more rights than you normally give us. All we want is access to the to the titles. Or if they want to change it so that e-materials are actually listed as books and not software, that um, would be an alternative. That would be a wonderful thing. Wouldn't um, it? I know that Alan is huh. working on getting some sort of digital right of first sale yeah. at a federal level where libraries might have an exception to licensing and it's we can do um contract abrogation if i'm remembering the term right um but um basically say yes we know that those are the terms you have for individuals but libraries have an interest in providing materials more widely than this license allows and we should have the right to pay for the license but to under fair terms um share it and be able to preserve it. Um, it may involve something like making controlled digital lending, the law, the land, and currently there's a big lawsuit going on about that. But yeah, that would be ideal. I don't think that that's gonna happen soon. And I certainly don't think the publishers will ever go for that. Um, hmm. uh, Michael, what you're saying uh, directly addressed their argument about the copyright right law giving the uh, let, let's say it's what directly what Jonathan, who's an attorney and knows what he's really talking about, says. And uh, again, if you haven't seen that Andrew Albany's article that gave his specific arguments, you know, it's it got a link to his the whole thing he wrote from Maryland. I can provide that for you. Um, I can also put you in touch with Jonathan um, if you have questions you'd like to ask him directly. Um, I think that. Um, that's uh, that's probably going to be one of the steps you're going to have to take in any case is you need somebody who really, when the arguments come forward, who can really say definitively, or here's how I respond to that in a legal, in a, you know, as legal advice. So we, for folks who signed on um, a little after th four o'clock, we also have Lisa Varga, who is the uh, director of the Virginia Library Association. 
And I saw she unmuted herself for a second there. So I wasn't sure if she wanted to chime in with anything. Yes, thank you so much, Jessica. Um, Michael, I'm guessing you've worked with some of my colleagues in the past. Um, and I just, I wanted to ask in light of all of this, do you think that the more states that attempt to pass legislation, the better our chances are of changing the way the publishers categorize these eBooks as books instead of software? I think the more states who pass this, the more likely they are. And, and first of all, let's say that not all publishers are bad guys. So right now, if you look at HarperCollins, one of the big five, they are providing on a 26 circ basis eBooks at about $14, $15 average. That's about what, 60 cents per circulation. That's gonna count as reasonable under any terms. So, and there's a lot of smaller publishers mm -hmm. who are doing just as well, or medium-sized publishers who are giving us interesting licensing terms through DPLA and um, the um, well, you know, variable license terms. So not every publisher is a bad guy, but I think the more states who pass this, the more likely the remaining big four and Amazon who is now working th through DPLA and incidentally, our, our Maryland bill, I am told um, by insiders, but please do not say this. Yes, Digital Public Library of America um, uh, did this bring Amazon. Public, this is a public meeting, Michael, that okay. is recorded and will be posted. Okay. So if you don't well, want to just say, okay, widely. okay, good. Let's just say that we have reason to believe that our, our Maryland bill maybe uh, helped Amazon decide they were going to come to the table. Understood. Yeah. Thanks and, for that. Yeah. Um, if so, I, just one quick follow up. Yeah, Are you meeting I, with any other groups in Virginia, like no, you're meeting with Fairfax right now? Because <clears throat> no, not with not in Virginia. Okay, so you, but you've worked with Maryland and the New York Library Association. Um, advanced with Connecticut, with Washington State, um, with Illinois, uh, with Pennsylvania, have have all um, done feelers like right. this and. I think that um, we'll see legislation definitely in Connecticut. Um, Rhode Island has got legislation pending already. It's sitting there, they're just waiting to reactivate it. So, but not in Virginia. In any case, I think the more states that do this, the more likely those remaining publishers are to come forward and say, okay, let's talk about what's reasonable. And remember, they can't talk as the group. They have to talk individually, especially after they lost that lawsuit uh, in which the big five and Apple were against Amazon and the big five and, and Apple got their clocks cleaned um, for price fixing. So they cannot mm. talk as a group. They have to talk individually. And been talking to a couple of the publishers on an individual basis. I, I think the more states that do this, the more likely we are to see the publishers who are, and Amazon who are not necessarily what we think reasonable are to come to the table and say, okay, let's talk about what reasonable might be. We may not as libraries get everything we want, but I think we can do better than what we've got now. So one of the reasons that I um, asked. Oh, you're frozen. Lisa, if she was gonna be out, the Commonwealth is gonna be look, if the, com can you all see me? My things, my internet connection's unstable. Yeah. You're freezing. Kind of freezing, you're freezing. Can you hear me though? Yes. Yeah, Good enough, I, I don't care. So uh, Lisa has been getting postbacks from the new legislation that was passed in New York. And people are wondering like, what happened in Virginia. And I mentioned that uh, Gary is interested in doing a collaborative approach on this to make sure that we have as many stakeholders as possible who are supporting it in Virginia. So I, I think that if this moves forward, even if the legislation is starting from a basis in Fairfax County, we're likely to have a lot of supporters across the Commonwealth, not just in, in Northern Virginia. You're, you're going to need those to obviously to get it passed. Um, I, I suspect Virginia is not quite so, well, maybe it is. Um, it, when, I, when I lived there, it, um, uh, there, there was a sense that North Virginia should separate and call itself Northern Virginia. Um, <laughs> Maybe that's still the case. You're gonna you're gonna need that support. I will say that um, in New York and Maryland, there was not a single negative vote. 
this legislation passed unanimously, <clears throat> you're going to find that you have wide support um, across the political spectrum, uh, especially when you say, you know, this is not anti-publisher, this isn't costing the state any money. If anything, it might help us get some money. This is just making sure people in Virginia get to read. I like it. From the political right, you may actually get some support because it looks like it's sticking into Amazon. It's really not, but it looks mm. that way, doesn't it? <laughs> let's let's get those big monopolies. Um, but yeah. Gary, did you have additional questions for, for Michael? <laughs> yeah, I have quite a few. <laughs> You're the uh, chair, you get to ask all the questions you want. Uh, let, let me ask you again too. Um, what is it that we have to have done by uh, August the 8th or whatever it is, uh, sure. we, we don't need legislative language. No. Right. They, no. So um, no. the deadline for boards, authorities, and commissions is August 3rd. And what we have to have by that point in time is um, an overview. It's that little fillable form. I, I think I sent it along with your last committee meeting packet. And really, it just needs to give background and an idea of what you're looking for. Um, it doesn't have to have legislative language. The county's legislative platform isn't specific uh, legal language that they want to have changed. It's not bill language. It just says things like, um, right now, the library has an item that says, uh, continue to request additional support uh, financially from the state and federal government. And so potential language could be um, draft something that allows libraries reasonable access to digital literary products that are available to consumers or, or something like that. We'll just want to backfill with enough information because I think our board of supervisors are going to have questions about this, that they feel like they've got a good starting point. Okay, because I, I read the uh, text of the uh, Maryland bill at Canvas and my three biggest questions were actually addressed by Michael when he gave the update. Uh, the, the, the whole copyright idea, the reasonable, which I don't know how in the world you can define that. And, well, um, I'll, I'll, when, I, I can tell you in a second, but please go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, and then also including the school. Those, those were my three things that, that really bothered me uh, about the Maryland law. Uh, and what what you're saying, Jessica, is that we, we, we can sort of uh, change as we go along here as, as developments uh, happen elsewhere. Kind of. So when we submit something to the county, we want it to be broad enough that they have a really good idea of what we're asking for, but it gives them some flexibility that they can, like if there are developments, they can say like, oh, we wanna add this or, oh, that's not gonna work out. Um, uh, the they tend to have every other week legislative committee meetings so that they've got a chance to review updates and more information for staff. So this group can continue to make recommendations and changes that can be incorporated later uh, past the August 3rd deadline as well, yes. Okay, great. Uh, yeah. uh, Michael, uh, you started to address the reasonableness. Uh, that, 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 to, that to me may be one of the real keys here. Okay, I've, I've put the link to the article from Publishers Weekly in the chat for you. Um, and that should have links both to the AAP testimony and Jonathan's response to it. Um, you will, if you draft the bill as we did, be attacked by the AAP or other opposition precisely because you don't define reasonable. Say it's too broad, it puts too big a, a burden on the publishers. The response to that is, no, this is creating a framework for a conversation. And we deliberately don't want the legislation to set market terms because legislators aren't interested in getting involved with the market and saying, here's what it ought to be for the most part. Um, at least at the federal level, um, there's been many indications where they say, 
let the publishers and the librarians work it out themselves. So I, I think that that's why we didn't want to define reasonable. But let me explain what the document I'm working on now with Alan and Jonathan and Carmi says. We're defining reasonable as print equivalent or physical item equivalent. In other words, what we want is anything can be reasonable if the terms are right. So I gave you the example earlier of HarperCollins, 26 circs for 13, 14 bucks for an ebook. That's about what 60 cents per circulation. That's not bad compared to what we get from print. So we're saying a metered access where you give us a time or a certain number of circs, if the price is right, that's reasonable. If you give us perpetual access, you might charge us more. But what makes this reasonable is that we can get and share digital content at roughly or just a little bit more the cost that we do for our physical items, as opposed to five or six times per circulation what we're paying for our physical items. Ebooks will probably, until we get that digital writer for sale, will probably never be as bang per book, ha, 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 excuse the joke, as print is. But we can get a lot closer than we are now. And some publishers are close. But what we're saying is, for a, over 100 years, we've had this arrangement with publishers whereby we've got this market that's developed. Let's just make digital content work pretty much the same way, at the same sort of price. And that's how we're going to be defining reasonable. And again, the publishers can't all get together and say, gee, that sounds good. But what we're hoping to do is open up a conversation with individual publishers that at least let them know, here's what we're thinking. And let's try to work with you individually to get there. Who would arbitrate uh, when you can't reach an agreement? It's very complicated. Um, the publishers are extremely frightened about um, what would be called price fixing. They think the DOJ Department of Justice is just out to get them after that suit where they were involved with Amazon. So arbitrating it, that's gonna be really tricky. I think that what it's gonna to have to be is individual libraries or perhaps the American Library Association Digital Content Working Group representatives. And we, we talk to them every year but working with them individually and, and just having them hear us and go back to their corporate um, owners and say, okay, you know, this will work for us. Arbitrating it, um, I don't know that they, they're, they're gonna be interested in a, a conversation that involves an arbitration with a library, even an individual one. This is Very complicated good. stuff. The third thing that you mentioned kind of resonated with me as well, which was about the schools portion of it. Uh, and I, I wonder if, if, so Diane and I were talking in advance of this meeting and we were wondering about the Rhode Island bill. So the Maryland bill is passed, the New York bill is passed and the Rhode Island bill is still in kind of limbo. And they're the only one that we think included schools in the language. That's yeah, and, and that's because um, Kyle at, at Harvard got a hold of it and said, here's, here's, you know, here's what we want. It's the only one that does. Um, where that bill right now is, is waiting to be um, recalled. Um, it was in place last year. They've reformulated um, it, but because it was in place last year and got set aside because of COVID, now they're waiting for legislators to say, all right, now we're going to revisit this bill, which is how New York did it so fast. Mm -hmm. I mean, well, practically overnight. So yeah. I've mentioned this to the committee before, but I'm really fortunate to participate in VLA's, um, it's got a really long name, but it's an advocacy committee. And one of the things that's been really nice about it is that it's a collaboration between public library directors and higher institution library directors, so universities and colleges. And they definitely have a different needs than public libraries. But they have needs as well around digital literary content. And I know Priscilla said that she was calling and I don't know if she can talk or if she's just listening. But yes. I assume FCPS I can, would I like can to hear you. help too. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. And I'm driving, so apologies. But um, yes, um, 
definitely the language around reasonable makes sense to me because even though we may have slightly different terms that we deal with, we still have the quote unquote unreasonableness as a um, primary issue. My question is that our school board has its own legislative agenda and its own lobbyist. And what I wouldn't want to do is to activate something that would get in the way or delay or confuse and so I wonder if there's any advice on the best way that we can show that the schools are on board with this without creating any um, unintended complications. So it, can I jump in again? This is Lisa Varga. <clears throat> As we have the Virginia Association of School Librarians in Virginia who we have a partnership with with VLA. And I just, I, I keep seeing the larger picture here that we get all of these groups involved um so i i hope we can talk about it more and i also want to just mention real quick that i know new york has their fingers crossed the governor hasn't signed the bill yet yeah i was gonna say come so that's sort of where we stand on that one yeah i don't mean to cut yeah. anyone off i just think getting vassal involved could be helpful no absolutely and i i um i'm also happy to you know i work with vassal all the time monthly and, and whatnot so i'm also happy to do that i just want to make sure that um you know, that we, we go about this intentionally with um, transparency too. So I have not yet done anything to activate it from the school side, but Fairfax County Public Schools has a pretty strong legislative presence in Virginia. And so I would really love for um, any direction on what I can do to maybe leverage that in conjunction. Uh, Lisa, you're absolutely right that Governor Cuomo has not signed it yet. It hasn't even been presented to him yet. Um, we in Maryland were disappointed that our governor did not sign, but I don't see any indication that he's going to veto this. Um, so even if he doesn't sign, it will become law ultimately. Uh, it's different um, than Maryland in that um, we set ours for January 1st of 2022. Um, that's because a certain large company um, that recently built a headquarters not far from you or is building a headquarters not far <laughs> from you asked for a delay in the bill becoming law. Um, New York has it coming on law right away. So it's really a question of when they present it to, to Governor Cuomo. They could hold it out, uh, they could present it soon. Um, in the chat box, I put a link to a document from the American Library Association, the Joint Digital Content Working Group paper. It does have an academic and a school section um, and it includes discussions of what is not reasonable for those entities, but your own librarians, I'm sure can tell you very well here. <laughs> it's different in some ways because of the need for much more group access for students or for classroom viewing, but it's still, in many cases, content isn't licensed at all. And there's room there for at least getting access to the content, even at reasonable terms, even if um, you, you don't get a price change. Michael, if, if there's no arbitration, uh, do, do we have enough economic clout that, to uh, make the publishers uh, come to an agreement? Uh, do, in other words, do they really want to sell to us enough that they will come to an agreement? I'm going to give you an honest answer. Um, it's complicated because there's at least one publisher who would frankly just as soon libraries went away and they got to sell everything directly to consumers because they'll make more money that way. Um, I think they'll make more money that way. They think they'll make more money that way. Now we in libraries think that we help create markets and create the purchase of items through discovery. And there's some evidence to suggest that. Um, I'm going to say that the person who at that publisher who really thought that and was, was um, arguing against libraries is no longer at that company. Um, I don't think they wanna lose libraries as a market. But the big thing we've got going for us is public opinion. Mm -hmm. yeah. If they're not gonna to come to the 
bargaining table with us if they're not going to, in spite of these legislations, do anything. I mean, it's possible they could say, hey, you've been you've been getting content from us all along, therefore it must be reasonable, otherwise you wouldn't have gotten it in the first place. We're compliant. And what we can do after these legislations is say, hey, we tried. Um, if somebody's definitely not gonna be compliant, um, let's say they continue not offering content to libraries, in Maryland at least our, our first choice would be to do a um, public campaign and call them out. And what the, the law does is it does provide a, a legal threat. I don't think Maryland's interested in suing a publisher, but if it really got right down to it, we could, so, somebody would have the ability to launch a lawsuit. Um, I don't think that they want the bad public relations. It does, so doesn't, does doesn't look good saying, oh, pff, libraries, go away. So there's two things I want to pick apart in there specific for Fairfax County. So the first is about kind of the, the purchasing power. Um, you all know that we spend, uh, Diane's going to tell me that I'm very wrong on this, three to four million a year on materials-ish. Okay, good. And you're welcome to unmute yourself and correct all the wrong stuff. But that's that's a good little chunk of change. And uh, I am almost positive that one of our professional journals, like Library Journal, does some kind of calculation every year where they talk about how much libraries spend on the stuff that we buy for consumers. Mm -hmm. And it's, it is a lot of money. And if you bundle in our school library colleagues as well, it is, yeah, I, I think they'd be surprised um, at the market segmentation loss that they would see out of this. Yeah, our, our schools are close to 3 million as well. Yeah, and that's just for one region of 1 million people. Um, and I think it is foolhardy of our colleagues in the publishing industry to think that every single library purchase that we make is going to be made up by individuals purchasing those items. That's, that's foolish. Um, and Michael, I, I might even push a little harder. Uh, we do have some, you know, marginal data that talks about the discovery power of libraries. You know, I go into the library, I check out a cookbook, I like a couple of the recipes, I buy that cookbook. That's me. I am one individual. But we have countless, unfortunately, anecdotal stories that tell us that same message, that people use our facilities to find new authors and to discover topics that they never would have found before. And in any type of economy, people don't have an unending amount of money that they can put to our discretionary costs like reading materials. I think we have a lot of fodder for some kind of public campaign around this topic because libraries are valuable in Fairfax County. People use our libraries. The other part I wanted to mention was um, Michael had talked earlier about working with the American Library Association's advocacy office with Alan Inouye and a couple of other folks, and they're fantastic and they'll be very valuable for us. I'd also suggest that we work with ALA's United for Libraries office, which supports uh, library boards, friends groups, and foundations. Because where library trustees and staff maybe have to wait for things like legislative platforms and making sure that we're aligned with county priorities, things like friends groups, and the foundation don't have to. So they can be a stronger voice for us at different points in time than we might be able to be for ourselves. Um, and the folks at United for Libraries, I, I think, uh, may be interested in helping support this through their networks um, with friends, foundations, and boards. Uh, Jessica, I've been hogging the uh, questions. Let, let me ask two quick ones and then try to encourage others to, to uh, ask questions. Um, number one, it, I, I hear you saying, Michael, that the only people we need to worry about are the publishers. We're not gonna find opposition anywhere else. You may from authors groups. Um, at Maryland, they did not do a formal, um, a, a formal testimony the way the publishing group did, but they did release a statement saying that they were opposed. Um, 
the one important thing to realize is that although they 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 talk big, neither the AAP nor the Authors Guild represent all authors. They're relatively small lobbying groups, and we have some authors who speak in favor of libraries getting a better deal. Um, so I I think that's primarily going to get. However, officially, I think you're most likely to see the AAP as an opposing testimony. It could, it could be others, but no publisher has weighed in. And I don't think any publisher wants to weigh in directly. It's going to be their lobbying agencies. Uh, my, my other question uh, has to do with the definitions and so forth. Um, we, we already mentioned the uh, uh, reasonable. I noticed when you first introduced your bill, you you only addressed books, and that was amended to, to make it broader. <coughs> um, and the second thing with the uh, the definition of various products, and then the definition of the various terms of licensing. Uh, have, do, do you think that you? really got on top of all those things things now and so we don't need to worry about uh, esoteric things like that? It depends on how far you want to go. And one reason why we stuck with public libraries in Maryland is that um, while there's music and there's, there's movies um, that are, if anything, even more restrictive from libraries than our books and audio books, that we viewed ours as a start. Um, you could expand the definition of what digital content in libraries is. Um, I feel comfortable and um, our lobbyists came up with the legislative, um, uh, the, the, the legislative uh, language and submitted it and then said, hey, is this good? And they said, you forgot audiobooks. Um, I do think that, um, I, I do think that those are very reasonable um, and that if we can get that as a first step, then the, especially the movies can come later. But a lot of content is being created in streaming right now in television shows and movies that never goes into a physical format and that libraries are excluded from. I think that's going to be a big battle, but it's not one that I was willing to take on just yet. Yeah, I'll shut up for a while. Just to... did, did that answer your question completely? Uh, probably enough. Um... Um, I have a feeling that, that, that those three things are evolving in these other uh, legislative uh, venues and that we may want to pick up on that down the road. Yeah, in a, in a purely FTPL sense, downloadable books and downloadable audiobooks are more important to us than movies or music because we don't purchase those right now. Uh, because we don't have a budget to purchase them because all of our money gets sucked up in repurchasing the ebooks we already have. So it may be more important to us later, but for now, I, I, I would kind of stick with the same thing Michael was saying that uh, digital literary materials probably make the most sense. Yeah. So um, other, other questions? Anyone who would like to pick the expertise of, <laughs> of Michael who's here today? I'll just start going around there, Sheila. Well, I don't have a question, but Michael, thank you for clarifying some of the definitions. Um, reading, reading about the, you know, the, the, the two libraries who have put forward the um, legislative in Rhode Island, I was trying to figure out where that was. Um, I keep coming up against the word software and print books and um, I, you've clarified not completely, but at least clarified how the language is being used because um, I think that we are on the cusp of a revolution in technology and um, it's pretty exciting, but um, I think that um, you, you re really kind of zeroed in on some of the questions that I had as making a little bit more clear. So um, thank you. Well, thank you for that. The, the pandemic has really 
brought, it's been a catalyst. We knew that more digital was coming, but this has made it come. And I'm sure you've seen the huge uptick in digital use during the time of the pandemic. Yeah. It's putting a real bind on libraries because once we have people starting to come back in, it's not like they're gonna stop wanting physical items, but they're still gonna kind of keep wanting more digital items. Yeah. So I, I have to say firsthand, I am seeing that among many, many of my friends who, um, you know, when you couldn't get to the library, you couldn't pick up those bestsellers or whatever, and um, everybody is is using some sort of digital, either ebooks, very, very popular, and um, and the books on tape, I still call them books on tape, the e-books um, are just... <laughs> are so popular. I mean, people are walking around with earbuds in all the time walking. So um, I think that this is something that the libraries really need to address because um, once people understand that they can't get what they think they should be getting from the library, they will be supportive. So thank you. So one of the things that Diane and her crew handle on a, on a regular basis are requests for purchase. Yeah. for both physical and digital materials. And I may have shared this at a previous full board meeting and my number might be a little out of date. So Diane, feel free to hop in. But we typically get maybe 10,000 requests a month. Wow. Is that still accurate-ish, Diane? Yeah. And sometimes we get requests for things that we can actually buy, which is lovely. And sometimes we get requests for things that we're never ever going to be able to get. And uh, you know how if you have a really good customer service interaction, you're just happy and you don't tell anyone. But if you have a poor customer service interaction, you tell 10 people about how you couldn't get the thing you wanted and the things that you could get, you waited for six months for. And that just, we have such good will with the public, but on the other side, these restrictions that publishers have put on us creates bad will with our users through nothing that we can fix because we can't buy those things. And we can only buy a certain amount of some things, which creates these artificially constrained long hold lists. I just pulled up my Libby account while um, Sheila was sharing her comments. And I'm, you know, 11 weeks out, 12 weeks out, six months out, six months out. And I, I know that our patrons see the same thing. And this is one opportunity for us to provide them more expanded access both to the stuff we already have for reasonable terms, uh, looking at getting reasonable terms and getting more of that content that we can't get now. Um, Diane, you were unmuted there for a sec. Did you want to share anything? I, I was, I just was going to give a, an example. Um, I'm a selector for nonfiction. I was the one who put in a request to purchase the e-book, you know, for um, Obama's A Promised Land. By time, even though I was the one that actually executed on that, um, I was more than six months, I still am two weeks out from a hold that I put on in November. And that is, and you it's an extreme you example. <laughs> and I knew we bought it. I was first in line. I mean, yeah. first yeah. in line, uh, but that's how many people had put in requests before we purchased it even yes. digitally, because they all go to the front of the line. Thank you. And isn't that a wonderful problem and to I, have, um, right? that people I, love the yeah. library and want to use our stuff? Yeah. Yeah, but I have a I'm going to slide my voice in here. This is Priscilla. I need to um, leave the call. I'm so sorry. And um, I would love to set up a time to talk with Jessica afterwards to debrief if that's possible. Yep, happy to. And Fran, before you jump on, Keith, I thought I saw you either your hand up or you were trying to unmute. I'm trying to keep track of the little unmute mute buttons. <laughs> Yeah, I, I just, I have a lot of good information here. It's taking a ton of notes. Um, one thing in particular that caught my eye and I, and I bolded it was that you mentioned that Harper Collins is reasonable. Um, are there any other uh, major publishers, I guess, that we should know of that's reasonable? Um, I'm waiting until... Um... July to see what the Amazon prices and the Digital Public Library of America are going to be. Until we see those, we simply don't know. Um, you know, and there's been criticism of Amazon from the library community for saying, oh, you're only going with one small vendor and I don't have library simplified apps, so I can't get your content anyway. Um, I don't know if Amazon's dipping their toe in or if that's going to be where they stay, but 
let's see what their prices are. Um, it could, you know, we're grateful they're sharing their, their, their unique content at all. And I do think that Audible, perhaps even more importantly, will come on board because of this law. I think that's going to induce them to mm -hmm. say, okay, let's start talking with libraries. And um, let me just tell you the follow-up to that. The reason why even that caught my eye is because that's the only time you use the word reasonable. And we've been talking about reasonable and unreasonable. <laughs> and so my attention went there and I wanted to see if there were any more reasonable. They are, uh, of the big five publishers who are responsible for probably 95% of the best-selling content, um, Harper Collins is the only one who on a regular basis we can say is reasonable, but there's lots of other more smaller um, or mid-sized publishers, uh, Abrams, Workman, um, who are in, in some cases um, like Biblioboard, so it's a small publisher, but they, it, it sounds like the title is expensive. It's $66. You get perpetual access forever. You get simultaneous access. As many people as want to can look at that book at the same time. So there's all kinds of ways something might be reasonable. It's not based on cost alone. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. there's a lot of publishers who, who work very nicely with libraries and, and we're, we're perfectly happy with them. But a lot of this best-selling content um, Harper Collins is the only one who regularly I'd call, I'd say is really reasonable in library terms. Now they all think they are reasonable. Keith, you were not on the library board when everything happened with Tor. And that was kind of a really horrific kickoff to some of the conversations that we're having now because they decided that they were going to test uh, a windowing process where they would only sell to the public for 45 or 60 days or something. Mm -hmm. um, and then they would sell the libraries, but they wanted to have like that two month period to see if that would increase their own sales, knowing that we would have so many requests backed up that we would have to buy more copies when we finally got that window open. So mm -hmm. for me, reasonable has lots of layers to it because um, the price is part of it. The duration of time they let us keep it as part of it. How many circs we can get on as part of it. If they have different models that we have to float through as part of it. It's um, kind of a hot mess. And Diane and her crew um, do a great job finding ways to make as much reasonableness as possible out of the terms and limitations that were provided. Diane, are there any vendors that we work directly with that you would consider reasonable as well? Um, Yes, uh, we do have the Biblio board. Um, you know, we we have the they have a lot of independent author. Um, a, a, indies indie authors are um, a pretty good um, place to get content. But again, that's not the one that everybody is like demanding. That's the one that can help alleviate some of those holds lists that people are demanding. And you say, well, while you're waiting on, you know the latest Patterson or Grisham, look at all this wonderful other content that we have of authors you may not be familiar with yet, but you know, they're new. Um, a poster right behind me, Olivia Dade, um, is, was an independent author who was picked up by Avon. Um, she's a romance author and she's doing very well um, with, with Avon. So, you know, they're really good things there. We use source books uh, a lot as well, um, you know, for, for things like that. So, I would say that there are some that are much friendlier um, and what I would consider reasonable, but what is reasonable for us as Fairfax County may not be necessarily reasonable for with Grayson, yeah. you know, that, yeah. or, you know, a publisher who is reasonable to a public library may not be reasonable in their school terms. Um, you know, when you have to buy copies per school, as opposed to a shared resource at the school level, you know, so, or for Syl and crew. So yeah. where, where we can buy one ebook and it's, uh, you know, it's not simultaneous use. It's one person at a time gets to use it, use it. She has to buy copies for every individual school. It cannot be a shared resource across all of the schools. You have to buy them per location. So it's, mm. it's, it's even yep. messier. Basically schools are treated as a massive consortium where you're buying a copy per Branch, branch and the school is a branch if you will so her budget is even tighter than ours around e-resources 
Okay, Fran, you were next. Yeah, um, a couple of things. I just wanted to say that um, I also have been waiting since November for the Jimi Hendrix book because in November, I wanted to look at it to see if I should buy it for my husband who was a huge Jimi Hendrix groupie in the day. Okay, just that. But the other thing, my question is, um, I can't wrap my head around the definition of an ebook as software. And I, when I talk to my friends about it, that's what they, they are saying, and that's why they license. And so I, I, I would like, uh, a, how can they say that? Because to me, software is something you install and you use it, you interact with it, it does things for you, et cetera, et cetera. Whereas the book, you, you borrow it and you read it and you return it. So how can they say that? They can say it because they can <laughs> Anything say it. Anything they want to. Like, say I, I, they I, want I'm telling to. you the truth. They can say it because they can say it. <laughs> okay. I don't know why years ago when these things were being hashed out, it was determined that an ebook was in fact something that you could license and not something that, li that you could own. But right. even you as an individual do not own your ebooks. A famous example is oh. 1984, Amazon had a... Uh, license to one version of it, they lost access to that version of 1984 and everybody's Kindle suddenly 1984 disappeared. Ooh. Ooh. They, gave, they gave you a <laughs> refund or an alternative book. It's not like you lost anything in the deal, but you as an individual couldn't keep that. You did not have the right to it anymore oh. because Amazon lost their right to it. So why um, it, wow. it's all under the Digital Millennium Copyright Act and libraries would like to see some changes. And I think it's time that, that as a country, we looked at that digital copyright, middle, digital, uh, digital, uh, <laughs> sorry, it's been a long day. And, and, our governor, and, and our governor got rid of all COVID um, uh, emergency restrictions yesterday, which meant a lot of dealings in libraries today. I, I, it's time to um, look at the Digital Millennium Copyright Act again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Okay, so there's no, okay, so I'm not alone and like what? Okay, no, you're 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 far from alone. Okay, yeah, I, I so I was in library land when when this all happened, and I don't remember there being any big discussions. I, I don't remember. I don't remember library professionals being asked like, "Hey, should these eBooks be classified as a book? Should they be software?" Should, it was just this decision that happened, and then they started selling a product and then we then there was a huge like well what do, what do you mean we don't get to keep these what do you mean that they're not ours we paid for them mm -hmm. yeah and in fact there was a huge to do in Kansas if I am remembering correctly with the state library and the state library in Kansas maybe somewhere in the middle somewhere in the middle of the nation there was a state library that had um been trying to transfer content their their e-content between one service provider and another. And it was this huge problem because you don't own these things. So like if we ever decided to stop using Libby, uh, I don't know what we would do because they don't have to give us that stuff to move to another platform. Right, Diane? They don't have to, they but have they to. have learned that if they, if they have licensed transfers that-, yes. that they yeah, will but they're not they're not obligated that. to do it and i think it's if they also have the right to resell that particular item yeah. so if there's an exclusive somewhere and now this it's been a while since i've looked into it because i looked into it and went oh i can't deal with that <laughs> um at this moment so michael might have more massachusetts detail on that. did this two years ago they went away from overdrive which is the the uh, company that handles Libby to um, Biblioteca's cloud library. And they, it took them almost a year to do the transfer of all the materials. And there were some publishers who refused, right. who said, our deal is with Overdrive. It's not with this other group. We will not let you transfer. Mm. So it's, it's like you get married when you pick one of these things. Um, you know, it, you can get out of it, but it takes a lot of doing. <laughs> I was just going to chime in there, friend, on that point. You, um, I don't know if you remember, but in the late 90s, music, you know, turned to digital, was pirated, right? And so the recording industry 
uh, and then the movies, right? They're afraid of piracy. So if I take, a, instead of selling you a physical thing that then you have rights to do whatever you want, they, through the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, changed it. So I sell you a license to this content that I can take back, you know, at any time, if you violate any of the terms of our agreement, which no one reads and just clicks through when they buy a digital movie or a digital song. And so then obviously books and any digital, any digital media that, you know, it falls into basically the same thing now because the, the, the publishers or the creators want to retain that and stop the piracy. So that's how they do it. And I think um, a lot of lessons were learned um, through the, um, what Blockbuster did with the movie studios um, and the reselling of videos, um, which, you know, those did end up going to a Supreme Court case where they were allowed to do whatever they wanted with, um, and it created Blockbuster, you know, and that whole video lending. And, and Mike, you're absolutely right. The publishers have been frightened of piracy. Ironically, if you give libraries better terms and there's easier access through libraries, I think you might see less piracy, but there's a huge market right now and, and you can find out all about it by going online and, and searching uh, about pirated eBooks. You know, they, they know they lose millions and millions a year that way. Yeah, and the study that was recently released through the Panorama Project um, supported that. They found that when libraries didn't have an ebook, 30% of these library users would turn to piracy instead of to purchase. So, of those people who used libraries, that's not the world in general, but. Arg. Oh, sorry. All right. Well, um, anything else? And yeah. Any qu uh, Kirk, did you have anything? Any questions you wanted to share? Uh, no, I've been uh, soaking it all in. Yeah, as I think Deborah told you, I'm new to this position, so I'm uh, I, I hadn't even started my job when I came to the last month's meeting, so I'm still getting up to speed. But this has been really great and informative, and I've been taking notes, and I'm gonna bring this to my people. But uh, uh, um, I can speak for Prince William. We're definitely you know in support of this, and we um, want to stay in the loop. And uh, when we you know have something to contribute, we will. But uh, we're thanks again for. Uh, letting me come. Absolutely. And is, is Prince William right across the the um, nice bridge from Maryland? Is that where you are? No, we're south of Fairfax. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. We, yeah. we've been Straight. involving all of our DMV buddies, but we haven't gotten okay. <laughs> as far into Virginia yet, although it looks okay. like we're going to. All right. Well, um, I thank you for the opportunity to talk with you and um, Diane and I uh, talk on almost a monthly basis for readers first or other things. Um, always happy to come back or uh, if you want to pass things along, just let me know and good luck with getting this going. I, I really encourage you to do it and hope that you are successful and it feels really good when you get it done. You feel powerful. <laughs> We'll so often we in libraries feel powerful. We feel good um, because we help so many people, but powerful, not so often. So this is a chance for you to really get out there. Good luck. Thank you so much. Right. Um, Gary, before I forget, we need to approve the May minutes. Yeah. So. I have to run. Take care. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm. okay, I think... Uh, all we have to do is approve the minutes and then uh, yep. set the next meeting, right? Yes. So yeah, I, I just want to make sure we get those approved so they can I be have part a, of it. And I have, a, I have a question. I found a tiny typo in the consideration item, and I don't know if that should come under the minutes or something so else. So the, the consideration item is part of the full board packet. Um, so if you send me that, I'll get it amended for okay. action for next month. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, Hannah, Hannah came home, and she what? needed to be with me apparently so oh, she's beautiful <laughs> she's so cute oh my god she likes board meetings this is this is this is her fun for the day yeah with those eyes so um you should have had the minutes attached to the the last update um yeah if someone would like to um move approval anybody <laughs> I make I move to approve the minutes from uh, last month's meeting. I second it. 
Okay. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. And opposed. Okay. That's done. And uh, what about the, the next meeting? Um, so because we didn't have a chance to review the draft legislative initiative statement at this meeting, I would recommend that you schedule a meeting in advance of the July full library board meeting so that you have a time to, to do that. And the July library board meeting is on uh, the 8th. I, I'm sorry, I'm confused. What? Do we have to have done before that? I thought we did what we needed to do before that. Um, if you wanted to review July 14th, excuse me, I had that off. Um, if you would like to review the the language for the the overview that's going to go to the legislative office, we could do that at the next meeting before I submit it so that you all have that. The consideration item that you approved gives me a, authority to Right. to do it if you all approve it. I would be happy to have you look it over in advance as well to make sure that we're not missing anything or there are key pieces we'd like to include. Okay. Yeah. So that probably take us just minutes. Yeah, it shouldn't take too long. Um, and if you all would prefer, I can include it as part of the action item for your full board meeting on July 14th. And then you can do that as a whole board and talk about it too. So your choice. Uh, uh. Oh, in other words, if we want the full board to uh, to see it, to see it. Okay. yeah. Um, well, what are the rest? Do you think of that? Is that something that we should uh, submit to the full board? Hmm. I don't know. Um, Sheila, for information only, or is is there yeah. an action? Um, so it will be an action item at your full board meeting on July 14th, whether or not to approve, um, authorizing you to, uh, yeah, the, it's the language that Gary shared at the last meeting that was part of the consideration item. If it's, if the board authorizes the library director to move forward with some type of language around this okay. topic, I don't remember the exact wording, right. Right. but I would be just as happy to include the, the legislative statements for a review by the full board because as we heard from today's meeting it's likely to get a lot of interest yeah but they, but because they haven't been a consideration item uh, they really could, can't do anything official about it yeah so i can include it as an attachment for review um, and then there could be feedback on that, that that goes along with the action item which is the authorization that would be my suggestion Okay. You're all right. Everybody, all right with that? Yeah. Okay. Um, what do you want? Do you want to email suggested times then? Or? Yep. I will do that, and I will try and find um, some evening times or some 4 p.m. and later times. Um, I know that uh, we've got some folks like like Priscilla and Keith who who work full time jobs as well. <laughs> So if everyone's okay with an evening meeting, we'll we'll try one of those, and I will give the baby to Stephen during that time so that she does not overtake all of our meeting next go around. Oh, that was the best part. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, one one thing for consideration, though, Bobby just reminded me, uh, if the governor's executive order uh, about the emergency is no longer in place in July, it has to be an in-person meeting. So. I will include that when I send around the dates. Um, so very likely an evening meeting and um, we'll, we'll figure it out from there. Okay. Uh, nah. Oh, you wanna to talk to everybody now? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, I'll send around some dates and um, the draft uh, I'll update the draft legislative initiative page with some of the information we learned today so that yeah. you all have a chance to review it in, a, in advance. Right. And Jessica, would, since I, I hate to admit this, but I will, I don't know how to copy the, 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 the link 
from the chat. So would you just send those out in an email? Yes. Um, so uh, the wonderful Bobby has uh, got those saved and I'll include that as part of a report out email. I am on vacation tomorrow, so I probably won't get it out till Monday. Don't worry about it. I'm a well too. Sheila, I was just going to say, if you click on the links right now, they'll open in your computer. That's okay. We'll wait yeah, yeah, but it's nice to have them handy for, for yeah, later yeah. too. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I guess we don't need a motion to adjourn or adjourn. Adjourned. Adjourned. Nice. It was so nice.